Hey everybody, thank you for stopping by our YouTube channel to check out this message. We hope it inspires you, challenges you, and helps you to grow in your faith. If you have any questions while you're watching this video, be sure to go to trinitynwa.com. We hope you enjoy. Just keep singing, hallelujah, I am not alone, amen? Emmanuel. God is with us. Think about that. Let that get in your soul for a minute. God is with us. And not just whenever we're singing about it. I'm talking about God has chosen to make his habitation among mankind, his creation. He has decided to live among us. He has decided to dwell with us. What, a, what an awesome dispensation of time that we live in because... Uh, had we lived before the time of Jesus, they lived in a dispensation of law where that the Holy Spirit came to the planet and he, and he did specific things, but he would, he would come upon people for specific works. But then after Jesus, when, when Jesus was leaving, he said, I'm going to go away, but when I go away, I'm going to send a comforter. He's going to come and stay with you. He, he won't just come and help for things and then go back. He's going to come and make his dwelling in you. So, man, whenever we sing that song about uh, hallelujah, I am not alone, man, there's something that leaps in my spirit. The Holy Spirit inside me says, I'm right here. I'm right here. I just like it. Amen? It's spring break, but let's have fun anyway. Somebody say amen. amen. I know some of you are not here. I can tell by looking. But those of you that I can see are. And I'm glad you're here, man. We're having an awesome time. The Holy Spirit of God is in this room, and we're having a great day. Amen. Amen. Well, I wish Stephen Magner was here, Chastity, because I wanted to tell him congratulations for being the hometown hero. Did y'all see that last week? Wasn't that amazing? I thought that was really cool. You tell him I talked about him behind his back, would you? All right. Amen. I've got another story to tell you today. I told you a story last week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you another one today. Is that okay? Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to tell the story again out of the book of John. This, is, uh, this happens around John. Our, our, our actual text will be John chapter 11, verse 16. But the story happens around chapter 10, chapter 11. Uh, I'll read this verse to you, which will serve as our text today. And then I'll give you some context for what's going on so you kind of understand the story. But um, John eleven sixteen 16 uh, says, it says this. Thomas, whose nickname was Twin, said to the other disciples, come on, let's go so we can die with him. Doesn't that sound like a fun title today? Come on, everybody, let's go die with him. Now, here's the context. A few weeks before this statement was made, Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem uh, for a, a feast called um, the Feast of Dedication. It was not one that God had instituted, but it was rather a man-made feast of the Israeli people. Jesus would not have had to attend that. He was not obligated to, but... He, uh, wanting to be a part of his culture, chose to attend that particular setting. And while he was there, he got into a discussion with some of the religious folks. Jesus and the ultra-religious folks didn't get along. And I'm not against religion. I'm very religious. I'm a very religious person. I eat usually three times a day. I'm very religious about that. But in my relationship with Jesus, I choose not to. If I can at all, I try not to get too religious because I see what happens when I allow religion to take the place of relationship, which is what was happening in the lives of these religious leaders who were so um, impressed with themselves and uh, what they knew that they were unable to have an open heart to see that God was there in their presence. Their Messiah was right there and they were laying eyes on him and missing it all. And Jesus is having this discourse with them. And in the midst of this conversation, he makes a statement or two, like Jesus was wont to do from time to time. Something along the lines of, I'm God. 
You know, he made that claim, basically. And uh, you go back, you look at it. Basically, that's what he's saying is, I, I am, I'm God. I'm the Messiah. And it made them so angry that they picked up stones. They were going to rock him. They were going to rock him to sleep. And he did what he always did. He got away. You see that several times in the New Testament where, where Jesus decided not to die, so he left. And that's what you got to understand about Jesus. He didn't die until he decided to. So here's another occasion where he decided not to die that day, and he left. And there's speculation as to how he did that. Some people say, well, it was magical. It was mystical. He just would, somehow he would just become invisible. I don't know whether it was that or, or else every, every time I'm reading about him, it seemed like there's a lot of people gathered around. Either because they want something or because they just want to see him. And, it, you know, sometimes you can get lost in a crowd. So I, I don't know. Maybe that's what happened. But either way, he decided not to die that day. And he left. And so about somewhere between, we don't know for sure, but probably three weeks to two months, somewhere in between that amount of time, this takes place. So put yourself in the spot of a disciple. You've been hanging around with Jesus. You're, you're going everywhere with him. You're watching him. You're being a part of his ministry. You were in Jerusalem three or four or five weeks ago. Uh, Jesus got into the religious leaders. They actually picked up rocks and we left. Then word comes to Jesus all these weeks later. Hey, your buddy Lazarus is about to die. Uh, he lives in Judea, Bethany specifically, uh, close to Jerusalem. And uh, the word comes to Jesus, says, this friend of yours is very sick. He's about to die. Your sisters want you to come and make him well. And you know the story. And that, that where we're going with that is one I preached before. I'm not going to preach so much about that part of that aspect of, of Lazarus being raised. But uh, rather from a little bit of a different angle we're going to talk about today. But um, Jesus stayed right where he was when he received the news. Lazarus is sick. You need to get here quick. He's going to die. And Jesus says, okay, let's stay here. And they stay a few more days, and Lazarus dies. And then Jesus announces to the fellas, okay, it's time to now go wake him up. And their response is found in John 11, verse 8. Teacher, they said, the people there want to stone you to death. Why do you want to go back? Basically, you know, we were just there a few weeks ago and they were actually holding rocks and we got out with our lives and now you, now the guy is dead and if we were going to go, I mean, if we were going to risk our lives, why not go when we could have done something? But at this point, why do you want to go back to where you know they're wanting to kill you for nothing? And I want you to notice, if you've got your pen and paper, I want you to... Take down a few notes today. I want you to notice the response of Jesus. Three different things he says in response to their um, confusion. All three of these statements, they sound different, but they're all basically saying the same thing. But in order to get it, you would have to understand the inference. And so... The disciples, even after Jesus makes these three statements, they hear what he's saying, but they don't get what he's saying. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Jesus responds in verse 9. Aren't there 12 hours in each day? Now, for all of those of you that are confused by that statement, there are 24 hours in the day. And even in the time of Jesus, they still had 24 hours in a day. So they're like, aren't there 12 hours in a day? No, there's not. This is already fouled up. He's talking about aren't there 12 hours in the day that they understood in their culture. There are 12 hours in the day that are good hours for going somewhere. We don't have cars. We don't have lights. We carry lamps. There's robbers outside. We don't move around and go great distances in the dark. But we got about 12 hours a day that we can actually do something in the light and go somewhere. And that's what Jesus is saying. Aren't there 12 hours in each day? If you walk during the day... You'll have light from the sun and you won't stumble. But if you walk during the night, you will stumble because you don't have any light. Now, the first thing that Jesus was saying here, because when you read that and you read it in context, it, make, it kind of throws you. And you're like, they ask a question and then he starts talking about there's 12 hours in a day. 
Like, it's like, Jesus, you're so hard for me to follow sometimes. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? And here's what Jesus was saying. I have to do what I came here to do right now because this is the right time for me to do it. And the inference in that statement, him saying that, was this. I'm not going to die because I'm going to do this. I can't do this and be dead. He doesn't say that. He, resp- he says, aren't there 12 hours in a day? We've got to walk when it's light because we don't want to get out here in the dark when it's night. So I've come to, I have come to do this. This is, this is the time. This is the right time. Basically, I am entering into my time. Remember last week, he said, my time's not come yet. I'm not going to go to Jerusalem because it's not my time. You guys go down if you want. But if I go down there, they'll try to string me up. So I'm not going. It's my, he's saying, it's time. It's time now for this. So the time is right for this. And the inference to that would be, if he says to them, this is the right time for me to do this, so I'm not going to die. He doesn't say that, does he? But that's what he's inferring. The second thing he says is then found in verse 11. Our friend Lazarus is asleep, and I'm going there to wake him up. And they replied, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll get better. And Jesus really meant Lazarus was dead, but they thought he was only talking about sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He is dead. And you're like, okay, I'm on, this, I'm on this carousel of I'm trying to figure out what Jesus is saying. Well, the first thing, first, first thing he said was this time. This time he is saying, here's his explanation. He really is dead, but I'm going to heal him. I'm going to raise him up. So I'm not going to die because this has to be. You see that? That what, I, what we're going there to do has to be done. The time is right, and it has to be done. So I'm not going to die. He didn't say that again, but you kind of gather that from the statement that he does not have intentions of going there and being killed. He's going there because it's time and because this has to be. And then thirdly, he says in 15... I'm glad that I wasn't there because now you'll have a chance to put your faith in me. Let's go to him. Here's lesson number three. He's saying what you are about to witness is going to boost your faith in me. And it's going to change your life forever. So again, I'm not going to die because I need to do this so that this will boost your faith and change your life forever. Everybody still with me? Wave at me. You're still out there. But they're not buying. They're not getting it. I'm not going to die because this is my time. This has to be. This is going to change your life. All right. Now watch this. How are they going to receive what he's attempting to communicate? We hear from no one now except for one person. The only one that we hear reply to everything that Jesus has just talked about is Thomas. You know him as Doubting Doubting Thomas. Poor old Doubting Thomas. We like to pick on poor old Doubting Thomas because he's a doubter. He doesn't put his blind faith in Jesus. He gets blamed for being a doubter. We criticize him. Listen to this statement. We criticize Thomas for being one of us. In fact, everyone in this room who is intelligent enough to think or plan or analyze or do what Jesus told us to do, which was count the cost, would fit into the category of being Doubting Thomas. I've always heard that Doubting Thomas was a bad guy. No, he wasn't. He was like me and you. How many of us are naive or trusting or gullible enough to just blindly jump up and follow after somebody without first considering all the ramifications. Or let me put it to you in a different way. 
How many of you married your spouse sight unseen? Not me. But I was happy. If you've seen my Debbie, you know I won. <laughs> somebody said, somebody said, Pastor, you, you know what? She just looks a lot younger than you. And they, and they didn't want to be mean, but they, I knew what they were saying. I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. If somebody got to be married to somebody ugly, I'd rather it be her than me. <laughs> so this is what she looks at, and she's what I look at, and I'm happy in the deal. And she's blind to it, I guess. <laughs> Love is blind. We don't marry without meeting first unless we're idiots on some stupid show on TV. We're going to meet that person. We're going to hang around with them. We're going to have some come to Jesus meetings over serious dinners. Okay, tell me everything. And I'll tell you everything about me. And then if we can still, if we can still abide each other, then we'll try this. Pastor Chad talked about it a minute ago. How many of you ever bought a house without seeing it first? No, he didn't. He and Megan were intelligent enough to look at that, study it, talk to an agent, talk to a banker, consider their finance. I mean, you, Jesus said count the cost. How many of you would, would buy a car without ever, and, and that's something else people could do now, Katie. Have you noticed that? The big, the, I saw it on TV the other day. You can, you can buy a car now from a big old bubblegum machine. <laughs> you put your quarter in, and the car comes out. How many people would buy a vehicle sight unseen? No, we don't do that, do we? When we have important decisions to make, we want to take some time and think about it. We want to look at it. We want to analyze it. We want, we want to get on Kelly Blue Book, right? We want, we, we, want to, we want to check things out. We want to make sure what we're getting into, at least... I'm not trying to be mean to you if you don't do those things, but I'm going to make this statement anyway. Put your hands over your ears. At least the smart ones do that. <laughs> Somebody's got up and said, well, I'm stupid, and I just buy cars without knowing. <laughs> and I've been married 12 times. <laughs> so, before we string up poor Thomas... Let's put ourselves in this place, and when we do, we're going to find out something very remarkable, something very noble, something very brave about him. Yes, he struggled with blind faith, but who among us doesn't? Our altars will be full week after week around here, and rightly so, of people who are struggling in their faith. Like Peter who, say, who lived with Jesus for three years and says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I watched you turn the water to wine. I watched you get the fish and loaves. I'm still struggling with this whole thing. I mean, Thomas was struggling with blind faith, but there's one thing he wasn't struggling with, and that was being loyal, being brave, and being committed, and being dedicated. You say, Why, how do you know? Because I see what he says. He's the only one who speaks up. Usually Pete has something to say, but this time Pete's quiet. They're all thinking about how can we change his mind. He wants to go back over there. That didn't work real well last time. I don't think. It... And then here comes Thomas and says, well, fellas, come on. Let's go die with him. That's doubting Thomas. When you study the context of what he said there, you realize that, that, that commentators feel like the words that are used to, to, to make that statement would, would somehow uh, lead us to believe that, that Thomas said that under much duress and was very sad in his statement, but he nevertheless makes it. So sadly he says, okay guys, this is our lot. This is what Jesus says we need to do. So let's go die with him. Hmm. He's the thinker. He's the planner. He's making 
a logical assumption. Which what else could you? What other assumption could you make based on the current information? We were just there. They tried to stone him. Somebody probably screamed as they were throwing rocks. You come back here. We're gonna kill you. You know. So the logical assumption is we we'll go back there and they're going to kill him and they'll probably kill us too because we're hanging around with him. But let's go die with him. He's prepared. But what's wrong with this? Now, I'm walking you down this, this road through the story. What's wrong with this whole picture? And here's what it is. Jesus is not going there to die. He's tried to tell them three times already that we're not going to die when we get there. But they haven't picked up on it. Now Thomas is brave and he's dedicated and he's willing, but he's missed everything. And here's a couple of questions I want to ask you right now. Why is it that we always fear the worst? Every situation. Oh, I got a bump on my arm. Oh, Jesus. I'll probably be dead in five months. Why is it we do that? Why is it we always assume that bad things are going to happen when we follow Jesus? We're like, well, because we read the Bible. And they're boiling them and crucifying them, hanging them upside down. They're dragging them into the theaters and letting lions eat them. That doesn't sound good. Well, yeah, but you're not living under Nero right now you could have been if you'd have made a bad mistake a couple of years ago just lost a few folks I'm not telling you how to vote and I'm not telling you we all made a great decision I'm just saying we probably made the best one we could We better not make a bad one to fix it. Oh, Lord, Pastor, move on. Move on. We're uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable, Pastor. We don't like it when you start meddling and talking politics or Bible. So move on. Okay, I'll be be moving on. Why is it that we always expect that living for Jesus and dying to ourselves? is going to mean that we have to give up every personal ambition or dream or goal or hope. Why is it when you talk to people about becoming a believer that they think automatically, I don't know if I'm ready to do that because I really don't want to just give up everything in life. Why is it people think that? That in order to become a follower of Christ, you got to just, because they hear the preacher say, we got to die to yourself. Well, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you got to quit living. In fact, you need to understand something. Surrendering your life to Jesus doesn't mean your life is over. It means your life just began. Thomas thought he was going with Jesus to die. And in a sense, he was right. But, but, but we need to talk about this for a minute. Jesus wasn't going to Bethany to die. He was going there to give somebody else new life. He was going there to encourage a family and all the friends. He was going there to teach his disciples a wonderful lesson about trusting God and believing God and relying on God, enjoying victory in God. Thomas, in his mind, is going there to die. But Jesus, in his mind, is going there to celebrate. Come on, Thomas. I'm thankful that you're with me. But get happy. We're not going there to die. We're not following Jesus somewhere to die. We're following Jesus so we can live. It's a celebration. But Pastor, you said something about dying to ourself, to our own ways. Well, yeah, but when we follow Jesus, when we decide to become his follower, we deny our flesh and our carnal desires. We crucify our flesh. We die, 
and we allow the Holy Spirit to, cut, to, to change us and, and take up new life and residence in our spirit, in our life, in our heart. And when we do that, we find it doesn't take us long. Those of us who questioned, those of us who were worried, those who thought we were going to give something up, those who thought this was going to change everything in a negative way, it doesn't take us long to figure out that the abundant life that Jesus had for us was the best thing that could ever happen, that we could never create as happy or peaceful a life as what Jesus already had in store for us. We had tried, we had tried to create that life for ourselves, and we couldn't do it. It was only by trusting Jesus and putting our faith in him and dying to ourself and awakening to new life in him that we realized, I'm free, I'm happy, I'm blessed, I'm at peace, I rest in my decision. My life isn't over. My life isn't worse. I remember my dad talking, used to give an illustration when I was a little kid. I, I used to love to hear my dad preaching. He told this story about when he was a lot younger, he was working out in California. He was framing houses. And that was the old school way where they had the big old, I've still got his big old hammer, big old hammer with the corrugated head. And, and he would drive a box, a 50 pound box of 16 penny nails, a box and a half a day with that hammer. He'd frame a house and a half in a day, a house and a half a day in those track houses out in Southern California, what, 50 years ago. So they're driving nails. I used to watch him, and he'd walk, he, he would lay everything out, and he would walk along those two by six and two by fours, everything laid on the ground, and he'd reach over and he'd say, tap, bam, tap, bam. He'd drive that 16 penny nail, with, set it with one tap, and drive it with one leg. Some of you are like, I don't know what that means. Well, a 16 penny nail is a long one. He did it for years. On his deathbed, he said, I drove one too many nails. <laughs> That's what he said right before he left. Like, I drove one too many nails. He told a story about working out on, on one of those uh, job sites where that every day for lunch, he would sit down and he would eat his lunch and he opened up his little New Testament and he would read his Bible. And all the guys around him, you know, would just kind of watch. It was, cur- it was a curious sight. That's not what everybody was doing out there on those job sites. They are over there throwing dice and playing quarters and all kinds of stuff. And dad's over here reading his Bible. And finally one day, one guy said to him, Daryl, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm over here reading my Bible. He said, what are you? He didn't say, who are you? He said, what are you? Dad said, well, I'm a Christian. He said, what, do you drink? Dad said, the Lord delivered me from that. What, do you smoke? He said, God delivered me from that. He said, well, do you cheat on your wife? He said, God delivered me from all that kind of stuff. He said, God just about ruined you, didn't he? And Dad said, no. God didn't just about ruin me. God made me into the man I am today, the husband, the daddy. Thomas, in a sense, was right when he said, we're going with Jesus to die. He was, in a sense, right. He was just sad about it. He was wrong about what that meant. He was right about the fact that he needed to die to himself, but he was wrong about what that that was going to require. When he said to the guys that day, out of bravery and nobility, come on guys, we're committed to this. We're dedicated. We love this guy. We've watched him. We know who he is. We're going to go with him. Let's go. He's going go, to go go die. Let's go die with him. He was right in the dedication. He was right in the commitment. But the sadness that was in his heart did not need to be there. He didn't understand it. He wouldn't understand it until this event was over. Then he would see when Lazarus is up and Jesus is hollering, okay, unloose him. And Lazarus is hopping around in the grave clothes and they're unloosing it. And and then the guy's getting free and his mouth's open. He's screaming and he's hollering, hey, let my arms out. And then his arms are going and his feet are going. And Thomas is standing there going, what? What? You don't even know what to say. 
and they're looking over their shoulders to see if anybody's going to throw rocks at them and nobody's throwing rocks and Lazarus is happy and sisters are well and I told somebody the other day they said wasn't that cool how how the, uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and I said yeah but you understand that was a double miracle something killed him to begin with so when Jesus raised him from the dead he had to heal him from whatever he killed him or he'd have died again that's a pretty cool miracle get up be healed Thomas witnesses all that the disciples witness all that I don't know that I don't see it anywhere in the scripture but I gotta I gotta think of a part of me like Jesus when he's hopping around he turns around the guy and says see see this is what you guys were crying about been dragging a mile and a half behind me and writing notes to your families goodbye I love you and we look this is what we're going here to do Hmm. I would say to you the same thing Thomas said that day let's go die too in light of the information that we have now let's go die too let's go die so that we can live let's go die so that we can succeed let's go die so that we can truly know happiness in this life let's go die with Jesus let's go live with Jesus Let's die to ourselves so we can live with him forever. Here and there in abundant life. The only way we'll ever know it. So. I want to bless Thomas for his courage and his commitment and his loyalty. But he learned a valuable lesson that day. He learned a valuable lesson that day. My my challenge to you is this. Let's rest in Jesus. And enjoy the journey of following him. And quit getting up every day drudgingly. Oh, we got to die to ourselves again today. Oh, we got to follow Jesus. Oh, I got to be a good example. I can't talk nasty today. Oh, I can't do this today. I can't do that today. Let's get up crucify our flesh every morning and raise our hands and say Holy Ghost let's go take me where you want to go let's do what you want to do I'm ready to live I'm ready to live abundantly I'm ready to have a good time I'm ready to be blessed I'm ready I'm ready to be fed I'm ready to minister to others let's go where do you think we should go today there's nothing like living that type of blessed life that comes from dying fully trusting wholly and following Jesus wholeheartedly let's go die too so Jesus says okay guys let's go and we say okay we're going but we're not sad we're excited because we know where this leads two things I want to pray for you about today thank you for stopping by our YouTube channel and watching this message Be sure to click below and subscribe so you can see all of our new content coming right here at Trinity Fellowship Online. And we really would love to meet you in person. So come by right here at our campus. I wanna meet you and shake your hand. If you have any other questions, you can go to trinitynwa.com or you can be sure to check us out on social media at Trinity NWA. God bless you, have a great day.